All right, welcome everyone. So I skipped the week five video. So this uh, week we'll be doing two videos at once. But even though I've had two weeks to prepare something, I do not actually have a demo. Or I have a demo, but it looks exactly the same as what we saw in the last video, uh, even though technically I did change quite a bit. So just to go over what I've been doing, uh, week five was kind of a, uh, a busy week with other stuff, moved to a different island in Hawaii, I got vaccinated, um, all that, uh, that sort of stuff. So I wasn't uh, the most productive that week. So I started some work on other things, but um, I didn't quite get to the point where uh, I felt like I could show you guys something. Um, so that's uh, that's why we're skipping. Uh, I, I skipped I skipped one week. So anyway, uh, another thing that I did uh, a lot of is talking to people and reflecting. So one of the things that I've come to realize is, um, you know, we have a solution here, right? Like um, the make path uh, solution is really interesting in, for making uh, high performance applications, but um, I don't have a clear problem to solve with it yet, right? So I have uh, the WebFist application that I worked on in the past where we had strong performance needs and uh, I had the notebook idea uh, and so on. So I, I do have like some, uh, some potential things to apply it to, uh, but overall so far it's been mostly a technical exploration. So one of the things I've been trying to do is to see if there are applications for this. Um, and one thing I've come to realize is for a lot of applications, performance is a problem, but not big enough of a problem by itself to warrant a rewrite, right? So if you have like your typical uh, web-based application, you might, um, you might start iterating uh, to make it faster as you are uh, doing more and more complicated things. So you might start using WebGL for some stuff. You might even start using WebAssembly for some things. Um, but it's not very common that it's such a big problem that people are saying, okay, we need to do a complete rewrite. The counterpoint to this maybe is that people do clone entire applications to the browser, right? So apparently the web itself is enough of an incentive um, it has enough benefits that people think that they can beat incumbents by uh, basically taking existing applications and rewriting them uh, in the web. In fact, the application that I worked on, WebVis, is kind of like that. So the question is, is it a compelling enough advantage to have your application be extremely performant? I would argue yes, right? Like even like if you get like 10% or 20% more performance, then um, then that might not be worth it. But if you get like 10x performance or even better than that, um, then it's probably worth it, even if it's just for the reason that you might be able to do things with your application that you didn't even imagine before, right? So, but it's, it's a hard sell, right? It's like a bit more theoretical. Um, it's only when people start really running into performance issues that they um, might start to consider this in, uh, in all seriousness. So, um, yeah, so you can iterate your way out of it a little bit, but I did some testing um, of WebAssembly versus native, and there's a pretty, pretty substantial difference, even in the simple application that I built with the point clouds. Um, I've looked online and the estimates vary, uh, of how much slower uh, WebAssembly is, um, but there is definitely a difference. Um, there's also different, yeah, I, like one of the things I don't know is what is causing uh, the slowness exactly. So there's two uh, major places where I can see it for like an application like MakePad, right? Like where you do, um, where you already do everything in WebAssembly. Um, and then you just compile the exact same application to native and to WebAssembly. Um, so there's, uh, yeah, at that point you don't have to worry about JavaScript, you don't have to worry about the DOM, like we know that those things uh, can be slow. You don't have to worry about uh, painting and compositing and any of that layouting, right? Any of the things that browsers do really, because 
we're really just trying to render directly to OpenGL uh, through WebGL um, uh, and run directly on the CPU using WebAssembly. So those are basically the two places where it could be slower. So um, it is known that Angle, which is uh, the translation layer between um, basically WebGL and the different native uh, rendering engines, um, is slower than if you would use uh, them natively. Uh, and it is also known that um, the instructions that are being generated uh, by the WebAssembly uh, compiler just aren't um, as good uh, of CPU instructions as if you were to compile it directly uh, to native using LLVM or something. So uh, th th there's, there's a paper from two years ago um, that goes into some detail here in exactly um, in which ways it is currently worse. And, um, and it's hard to say how much of that is just a limitation of WebAssembly and how much of it is um, a more deeper problem there, right? Like you, um, like a fundamental problem that I, c I can see there is that WebAssembly, the way it's structured now, you always want to compile it just in time, so to speak, right? So you probably don't want to have a very slow compilation um, process that does tons and tons of optimizations because you want to run the code as soon as possible. So may, yeah, I don't know, maybe in the future they will do something where you can sort of like pre-build different WebAssembly optimizations for different platforms. It kind of go, goes counter to the whole spirit of WebAssembly. Or maybe they will do something where once the application is started, um, maybe they will replace some uh, some parts of the generated code with uh, faster uh, instructions or yeah faster faster code uh, as they keep the compiler running. But then you have a compiler running on the background and that is not going to be too fast. So I don't know exactly um, yeah how they can fix this. Uh, there's also the the issue of just having fewer instructions available, and this is slowly changing, right? Like so, WebAssembly is getting support for. Uh, SIMD, it's um, getting support for more efficient memory copies, which was a pretty big deal, apparently. Um, so yeah, I don't know exactly where it comes from, but uh, there's some information out there if you're curious. Uh, I, I certainly found it very interesting. So anyway, just to get back to this point then, um, you can iterate and get your application faster and faster, right, if you have a web application. Um, but at the end of the day, you can get to a local maximum, right? Like your final result might be uh, that you're almost completely in WebAssembly, almost completely using WebGL, and then um, you're sort of at, at the local maximum of what you can do within the web browser, and then you would really need to switch to, to a native application. Um, so it might be easier to you know, do a rewrite and start with a native application that also compiles to the web from the start, which is the MakePad approach. Um, but it's hard to say. Like maybe you can even get out of this local maximum once you're completely in WebGL and WebAssembly because then, you know, presumably you can uh, replace your WebGL uh, rendering um, without too much trouble with like native rendering engines. But uh, or like borrow some code from MakePad there or whatever, but it's certainly not, uh, yeah, it's it's a long road to get there, right? So, uh, but I haven't quite found an application yet that uh, that would really warrant, warrant this. So um, I think what I was doing with WebFizz is one of the applications um, that could benefit pretty directly from this. Uh, but aside from that, I've just been trying to talk to people and see if there's um, uh, if there's some interest um, from from anyone working on a performance intensive application. So yeah, that is what I need to do. Is I need to find a good application for this. Uh, the interactive notebooks might not be the best place to start. Um, like notebooks, when you're working on notebooks. Um, performance is not necessarily the first thing that you run into. I think it would still be cool to build like a, a, a Rust Wasm notebook. Uh, but at the same time, it is extremely similar to what MakePad is doing, right? Like they focus a bit more, more on application design, but like it, 
they're going for a highly, highly interactive approach, and so it's, it would be fairly easy to make it more of a notebook uh, approach. So I don't, um, I don't think it's like something that I can necessarily uniquely contribute something to, because they're they're well on the way. I could take a simpler approach, right? Not not using Makepad and just use Wasm bind gen and um, I think I think that might be uh, easier f for yeah. I'll I'll talk a little bit later about some of the the experiments I've been doing with um, with getting a notebook to work with uh, with Makepad, but um, yeah, I'm just not sure if this is the best application uh, for, uh, to me for me to focus on after all. And so yeah, I mentioned WebVis. I think one of the benefits that that has is that it's an application I'm already familiar with, so I don't need to figure out. Um, the space, the domain uh, of the product. I know exactly to what to build, at least initially. Um, and so I can really focus on figuring out how the technology works, right? Because that is the big unknown here. Um, another thought I had is I probably shouldn't lock in MakePad quite yet, right? Like I should keep my options open still. So the final thing that I think I want to try is Flutter. Um, actually, last time I said that I would also try web render. I looked into it a little bit, and I don't think that it is an amazing fit uh, for what we're trying to do here. Especially, like it doesn't compile to WebAssembly yet. It, it's pretty heavily threaded, um, so it would be quite a bit of work uh, probably to fix that. Uh, it might also use other particular like uh, uh, features that we don't uh, that we can't quite use one-to-one -one yet and flutter in some sense is um taking exactly that approach right like flutter uh i learned recently was originally started by uh folks who were working uh on the chrome browser and who decided to just strip away everything from the browser until you have just the rendering pieces left and then using that uh, to do mobile development and that is an interesting insight actually right like mobile applications actually run into performance issues much more quickly than desktop applications. It's a space that I'm completely unfamiliar with, mobile applications, um, but the fact also that Flutter focused on it um, make, make, yeah, makes, it, makes it more interesting to me. So I should probably at some point figure out uh, if there's, uh, um, yeah, what exactly the mobile space is like if there's room for uh, applying like the techniques from MakePad uh, uh, there, for example, because I don't think that the MakePad people are really focused on mo mobile. Um, so that might be that might be interesting to look at, but it's just so unfamiliar to me that I think it might be more useful to l f for me to first learn a bit more about how the technology works before I do that. But Flutter, um, Flutter kind of took that approach and. Uh, took the approach of taking a browser, simplifying it, and then using that as a library for doing cross-platform development. Um, so I think I should, I should uh, try that out. And one thing that I reflected on is like, what exactly are my goals, right? Like, what, what do I want to do here, right? And I think primarily actually my goal is just satisfying my own curiosity, right? It's just, I've been working on these applications for so long and it just feels like there's a better way to do it. And so I just want to uh, scratch that itch, so to speak. Um, and if I do find a good use case for this, then that would be great, right? But I shouldn't be too, too attached to um, this particular technology. I can always go back to work on other things. Um, but I thought it was like important for me to to realize this because you know it's not like I necessarily want to uh, apply this if this isn't like the right tool for the job, right? I want to, uh, uh, I want to mostly, cur yeah, uh, satisfy my own curiosity, and then I want to uh, ideally find find a good use case for it. And I think that there there are some there, like 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 I mentioned, I think WebFish would really benefit from this, but. Um, uh, it is not that easy uh, to find to find other uh, applications that where people are like, yes, you know, let's do this immediately, right? Like it's so clear that we that we need this, right? Uh, it's it's all a bit more. Uh, 
yeah, the the business case is, is not that that clear cut. Okay, so let's get into some technical stuff. So I tried to do the Rust notebook thing with MakePad, uh, right? So I I think in week two or three, I, I don't remember, I demoed a very basic prototype of um, being able to write some code in the web browser and then hitting a compile button and a run, bu uh, run button and it would uh, compile on the back end and then ship the, um, the WebAssembly code to the front end and run it there. Um, so I wanted to recreate that, but using uh, MakePad uh, and then both in WebAssembly and natively. So I started with uh, the native approach. Um, so what I did there is I loaded, I basically compiled a MakePad application and then I also compiled, um, you know, my, um, uh, my user space application, so to speak, right? Like the application that the user would type in. Uh, and I compiled both with MakePad, just with the same MakePad code, with the idea that if all the function names are the same and all the data structures are exactly the same, then these could just interoperate. Um, I ran into one snag there, which is that if you have some static global variables, um, then you know the the two different pieces of code will uh, might. Uh, both refer to those global variables, but they will refer to different ones, right? Because they will both allocate their own uh, space for um, static global variables. Uh, turned out that there was only one, and I could just turn that into basically a pointer, and then uh, before I would run the client program, I would just redirect that pointer to, to match the one from, uh, from the main program. And doing that, it's... Um, it worked perfectly. Um, it seemed like you could, yeah, just call from from methods back and forth, and uh, and that that worked very well. Uh, in WebAssembly, I couldn't get this exact same approach to work. So, WebAssembly doesn't uh, have a great way of loading dynamic libraries yet. So, if you recall, WebAssembly has one uh, static, uh, uh, yeah, memory space. Whereas with native applications, most operating systems give you, and actually the CPU gives you, um, uh, uh, you know, the page table essentially, right? So a process uh, or like a for a dynamic li uh, library, you can easily just allocate more memory for it. Um, yeah, and then within that, you can uh, it can basically do its own thing, and there's no no conflicts necessarily. Uh, but with WebAssembly, you kind of have to be very careful that you don't reuse the space, uh, the memory that was being used by the main application in your client application, because although by default it would just overwrite it if you assign it the same, uh, the same memory space. And so there's this technique called position-independent code, where basically for all the uh, st uh, static data that gets allocated, um, it bakes in an offset um, into each piece of code that uh, refers to uh, those those memory locations, and then before the program starts, you can set this global uh, this global offset um, so that you know it, it will it will use the uh, the space in the right location. So that is pretty cool. It is um, supported by LLVM, but there's a lot of asterisks. So if you use C plus plus, you would typically use mscripten, and then it should basically work. Um, also, if you just hand code stuff, it should also basically work because the WASM specific linker also supports it. Uh, but the combination of Rust uh, with this mscript and stuff and with the, with the different linkers, like I couldn't find a combination that actually makes this work currently. Um, for example, if you use mscript and, uh, and then you turn on this feature that, uh, that says this is a side module, that's the terminology they have for the dynamic library then it won't link Rust files anymore. So I could probably figure that out, um, but I was already spending two and a half days or so on it. And so I figured it wasn't, uh, it wasn't quite worth, uh, worth it there's, because there's also other ways that you can do this, right? Like you can also say, okay, it's a completely separate application and we just tell it sort of where to render. So you have to do a bit more manual um, 
uh, yeah, you have to communicate sort of the the boxes where it's allowed to render, and you have to make sure that it gets the right events uh, and so on. So it's, there's a bit more manual work involved there. Certainly not insurmountable, but um, that in combination with my realization that maybe the notebook uh, idea isn't isn't the best use of my time necessarily right now uh made me kind of like pause that so in any case i thought it was interesting um it's very it's very interesting just learning how all this uh, very low level stuff works uh this position independent code stuff there's also uh an object file object files are usually relocatable right uh which makes sense if you have like multiple um libraries for example that all have some static variables then you don't want them to be all on top of each other. So then, during the linking phase, it can move some of these uh, some of these things. And there's like metadata I think encoded in the in the object file too that says, okay, this is how you can move these things. So I was also thinking about that, right? Like maybe I can just tell the linker to just move everything by a certain amount. Um, but uh, yeah, I didn't look too much deeper into that but it's uh, it's technically quite interesting stuff. So yeah, that is basically it. Uh, I want to try Flutter. I want to build something uh, bigger. And I think I should just continue talking to people, um, seeing where there is a need for very high performance uh, applications. Um, if you are interested in this, you know, definitely leave a comment, shoot me an email, find me on Twitter, um, because I'm eager to connect with um, with people who actually have a need for this um, because I think that the way that we've been building applications especially on the web right like the web gives you a lot but it also you also have to uh, you have to um, compromise on performance and so um, it would be it would be wonderful if we can have our have our cake and eat it too, right? Like if we can both have our performance and our uh, all our other tooling. And I think that in the long term that is possible. And I think it is the future. And I want to be working on the future. So that's my pitch, I guess. <laughs> for those who might be interested, definitely reach out. That is it for me. See you soon. <laughs>